townies were running high. Now imagine Dave and his friends taking home a section of the goalposts as a trophy of victory. That was a long, long time ago, I tell you. Well, they were set upon by some local toughs. In the evening, an ensuing fight, Dave decked one of them and then experienced revulsion at what he'd done. Here's how Dave explains what happened. The lesson I learned was as simple, direct, and unarguable as the lesson a child learns the first time it puts its hand on a red-hot stove. Never do it again. But the pain I felt was a spiritual pain, as if I had suddenly emerged from a fit of anger and realized that I had pressed a child's hand across the stove. I knew that I would never again be able to strike another human being. That moment also showed him something else, how sadness and shame can lead to love and change. He stayed with the young man, apologized and walked him home. As they parted, Dave felt what he called the power of our unexpected and unusual bonding. The impact of that encounter has stayed with Dave throughout his life. Many of us know Dave as an activist dedicated to nonviolence, but the path he took had many turns, and at one point, as a student, he was tempted to pick up a gun. The year was 1936, and he was on his way to Oxford University on a fellowship to get a doctorate. As he recalls it, during the sea voyage, the ship's radio announced that Francisco Franco had launched a military attack on the Popular Front, which had come to power the previous February. Arriving in Spain, he saw the non-hierarchical communal settlements established by the Front and stayed at the People's University in Madrid. As Franco's soldiers advanced towards the city, he even considered joining the resistance. If his friends were going to die, he thought he was ready to. He also believed that the help of the communists might lead to victory. But in the end, he couldn't ignore the grim reality. Communists were shooting Trotskyites, and both were shooting anarchists. In fact, while he was in Barcelona, some anarchists even fired at his car. He didn't choose the gun. Instead, he came to a conclusion that has informed his activism for the 65 years since then. He put it this way, whoever won in an armed struggle, it wouldn't be the people. A year later, back in the States, he hit the road. Rejecting the comfortable path before him, Dave walked out of Yale. Wearing his oldest clothes, without any cash, he traveled around the country, riding freight trains, sleeping at missions, standing in bread lines, even begging for money. Off and on, this journey continued for the next three years, following a path inspired by Francis of Assisi. In a way, my whole trip was a first experimental step down the road Francis had traveled rejected his heritage as the son of a rich Florentine merchant, living the life of the poor, even kissing a leper. Now as I felt a wonderful new sense of freedom, it was Francis who filled my thoughts. Oddly, the image that came to mind was not of Francis doing what I was doing and what the poor often have to do, asking for help from those who consider themselves superior. Rather, it was the image of Francis kissing the leper. I didn't kiss anyone and no one kissed me, but I couldn't get the image out of my mind. Finally, I concluded that I had become the leper. By unashamedly approaching the healthy and asking for food, I was affirming the rights of society's lepers, and I was asking the people I approached for more than money or food. I was asking them to come a little closer to being St. Francis. At this point, I'd like to introduce Dennis Brutus, hero of South Africa's liberation struggle, and currently a leader in the struggle for debt cancellation. 
Thank you. We are here this evening to pay tribute to Dave Dellinger and Elizabeth Peterson and their courage and their commitment over the years. And it is a privilege for me to be part of this tribute occasion. I've been associated for many years with Dave and Elizabeth in the struggle from the 60s when I came out of prison in South Africa where I'd been with Nelson Mandela breaking stones and where previously I'd occupied in Johannesburg the cell that had been occupied by Mahatma Gandhi. And I came to the United States and worked on the civil rights issues, on opposition to the Vietnam War, was allied with Dave in many of these issues. But in addition, we were engaged in a struggle against racism in South Africa, the struggle for the freedom of those who were in the prisons of South Africa. And in that too, Dave and I were allies. And we went on to build a major struggle at the universities for divestment of American banks and corporations in South Africa and succeeded in that major campaign. My association with them continued beyond that and continues today. And in fact, quite recently, Dave and Elizabeth and I were in Puerto Rico, in San Juan, and went on to the island of Vieques, where I presided over a judicial tribunal condemning the United States Navy which is still using that island for bombing practice and indeed has leased the island to the other NATO partners so that they can have bombing exercises there as well. So there are many struggles that continue in our time. And in fact, I believe that we now need the inspiration and the commitment of Dave Dellinger and Elizabeth Peterson even more because we are confronted in our own time with a new and enormous kind of global challenge. And that is a challenge we must all confront. And so on behalf of all of us, my thanks to Dave and Elizabeth. On behalf of Women's International League for Peace and Freedom and its project, The Raging Grannies, we want to welcome you all and we'll sing a few songs. This man is our man, this man is our man, from Okinawa to Yenges Island, from the Redwood Forest to the Gulf Stream Wall. Sands of first diamond deserts, and from within. 
her breath. <laughs> The 1940s were not easy times to oppose war and promote nonviolence. Dave was living at that time and working in Harlem while studying at the Union Theological Seminary. When the conscription law was passed in 1940, he opted not to accept an exemption because of his status as a seminarian. Instead, he and several others refused to register for the draft. His reasons for opposing the unfolding world war were complicated. He knew about corporate support for Hitler and the Nazis. He had also visited Germany and concluded that there was potential there for internal opposition. In general, he saw the conflict as a geopolitical chess game rather than a fight against tyranny and racism. Beyond that, he couldn't stomach having an exemption when so many others, especially blacks, didn't want to kill, but were given no choice. Dave's decision not to register soon led to two of the most important events in his life, meeting the love of his life, the woman with whom he would spend the next 60 years, Elizabeth Peterson, and going to jail for the first time, but not in that order. First, he was sentenced to a year in the Danbury Federal Prison. Early on, because he sat in the black section during a Saturday movie, he was put in solitary confinement. And then, when he refused to answer to a number or submit to harassment by a guard, he was thrown into the no notorious hold. Some prisoners were broken by that experience. But for Dave, it led to another breakthrough. For no reason I can explain, I began to discover how little it mattered where you are, or what anyone does to you. I was sure that what I had done to get there was right. And somehow, the longer I was there, the better I felt. Maybe that wasn't it at all, but anyway, I never felt better in my life, even if I was shivering or wished I had something to eat, or a cigarette. I felt warm inside and filled all over with love for everyone, everyone I knew and everyone I didn't know, for plants, fish, animals, even bankers, <laughs> generals, prison guards, and lying politicians. Why did I feel so good? Was it God or approaching death? or just the way we're supposed to feel if we're not trying to make life into something else. It didn't matter why. The only thing that mattered was that it was happening. Shortly after getting out of prison, Dave was invited to speak at a national conference of the student Christian movement in Ohio. Pearl Harbor had been attacked and World War II was fully underway. It was hard to know what would happen next. He might even be arrested in the middle of his anti-war speech. Instead, he got an enthusiastic response and several requests for interviews. One of the student interviewers was